Euro survive? Will the Eurozone survive? Will there be the Grexit, as they call it, the exit of, of Greece from the Euro? Will Spain make it? What is happening there? The future is very, very dire for Europeans on the continent right now. And we see the economic crisis inside this country as well that there's 12.5 million people unemployed and, and an amazing 88 million people out of the workforce right now as we speak. They're not even counted in the unemployment numbers. So, you know, we see for the first time in history, the media just announced that white babies now, having been born this year, are in the minority uh, compared to African, indigenous, Asian, and other nationalities inside the U.S. So this is a crisis for white people. We see uh, something very interesting unfolding as the economic and uh, uh, political crisis of imperialism unfold, the threat of greater state repression for white people being a possibility. And um, we see something that's taken for granted is going to be carried out around the world against oppressed and colonized peoples, and taken for granted and carried out in the African community and the war on the African community. But now we begin to see the possibility of the threat of greater repression for white people, which is pretty unusual in history. And we see all around the world that oppressed peoples are resisting U.S. imperialist war, occupation, and theft. We see African resistance inside imperialist centers. This was a picture from London last August. And we see resistance growing resistance of the African community inside the U.S. as well. So how does the white population deal with this? Most, uh, most, a lot of the white people are living in fear of the future, our uncertainty. What's going to happen? Where's our place? What are, what are we supposed to do about this? And that we know, as the chairman says, that there are scientific solutions, and, and in fact, the occupation began in 1492 with the genocide of the indigenous people, with Columbus coming to this hemisphere and carrying out the genocide against the indigenous people and beginning the trade and African human beings that we're going to talk about a little bit more. So what we have to begin to do, as has been mentioned before, is to begin to see the world as everybody else sees it and experiences it and to understand that for our future, we have to hook up in solidarity under the leadership of the African Revolution and oppress and colonize peoples around the world. So, as the chairman always tells us, if we look at history, we look at things as they were. In the Middle Ages, Europe was, was pretty impoverished. In fact, there was a thousand years that they call the Dark Ages, and that we call the White Ages, that where Europeans were, had nothing. They were impoverished, the majority of the people were serfs tied to the land. Uh, there was rampant disease. There were very few, if any, rights that people had. Um, that, and and the, the tiny percentage that were the aristocracies, the lords and the ladies, they didn't really have much either. In fact, there wasn't even currency at that time. It was just a matter of owning a freezing cold castle on some hill. And you know, it was a, it was a pretty bleak, bleak place between the end of the Roman Empire and a thousand years later. And we'll say why that change happened. But this was the system of feudalism, a thousand years of, of poverty and disease in Europe. So what changed that? What changed the situation for Europe? And as we can see, and as Chairman O'Malley Chatella tells us, the beginning around the early 15th century, beginning around 1400, 1415, Europeans, starting out from Portugal in particular, later Spain, later Amsterdam, and other, other countries got in on this, uh, began an assault on Africa, began taking ships and going to the West African coast to begin to loot and pillage. And this is when the trade in African human beings began, and it brought unprecedented wealth into Europe for the first time in history. So as the chairman tells us, this is how capitalism was born. This is how capitalism was born. 
there was feudalism in Europe until they developed a commodity by enchaining and capturing and kidnapping an entire continent of human beings and selling them on the world market. This is where it began. The, the birth of capitalism, it started on the backs of African people along with the genocide of the indigenous people and the colonial domination of the majority of humanity. You know, it's a really interesting thing because look at history, really study it. And you can see, this is what happened. I, I once, back in the day, I saw a comic book on how did capitalism start? And it said that it actually started in the Middle Ages when everybody was poor and we were just talking about it, and feudalism. And there were these things called guilds where people started, you know, sewing things and making shoes and doing it together in little groups. And this is how they got rich and powerful. <laughs> but what? I mean, you know, if you've ever tried to start a business, you know that you have to have a capital infusion to make money. You don't just accrue the most amazing wealth that's ever existed on the planet Earth from sewing some shoes collectively in a room. That doesn't happen that way. <laughs> so, you know, as the chairman, as the chairman points out, that there was something that Karl Marx called the primitive accumulation of capital, which means the first capital infusion. Where did that come from? And it came from enslaving free and independent people, terrorizing them, selling them as a commodity, the first commodity of capitalism, and beginning to accrue the enormous wealth that came from that. In fact, history tells us that already by the year 1500, that's eight years after Columbus sailed to the Americas and began the genocide here and taking over the land. By the year 1500, Europe had already stolen 700 tons of gold from Africa. And if my math is correct, that is about $340 billion worth of gold, just in that alone. So talk about this massive confusion. One time I had the opportunity with the chairman and other leaders of the African People's Socialist Party to go to the British Museum and, in London and there's, you know, amazing statues from, stolen from Egypt and the African civilizations and there's stuff from Babylonia and all kinds of other, other artifacts and great art is there. But it, there's like, there's this other part of the museum, and if you sort of wander over, it also gives the history of Europe. And you can see it. I mean, it shows, it starts out at the same time that in Africa there were these amazing statues and, and, and civilization going on. In Europe it shows like little places where fires were, and people were struggling to light a fire and living in a cave. And, there was nothing. There was just extreme poverty and ignorance and backwardness. And the only time, as you go through the years, you go through the centuries in this part of the, of the museum, it's not until you get to the year 1500 that there starts to be something akin to civilization, quote unquote, to wealth, to power, to big buildings. And this is exactly when the trade in African people began bringing the wealth into Europe. So we can we can see that. And you know, we have to understand that. How can a system built on the backs of the enslavement of African people and the genocide of the indigenous people be reformed? There is no positive to this. This is inherent in it. This is the pedestal on which it stands. So when we stop to think about that Africans were the most lucrative commodity that had ever existed. A commodity is an item for sale. And that, you know, today people look at the stock market and say, what is oil selling for today? What is Apple computers selling for today? But 150 years ago, people looked at the stock market and said, what is the price of an African today? This is the foundation of the system. The genocide of the indigenous people and the theft of their land. This is what the chairman has defined and deepened from the understanding from Karl Marx. The primitive accumulation of startup capital for capitalism is the stolen humanity and genocide, the stolen properties, the lands, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge. We, 
you know, the ability to make computers and understand astronomy and physics and all of this came from the ancient societies and these understandings were stolen. The destruction of culture and beliefs, the torture and the inquisition, the enchained, the indigenous people enchained in minds, the white terror against African and indigenous people, colonialism, the opium wars, and the wars of plunder and occupation. In fact, if you look at every single war that Europe has been involved in since the year 1500, it's about who's gonna, who is going to control the trade in African people, or who is going to control the genocide, or who's going to control the colonialism around the world. The first stock market was Amsterdam, based on shares in the trade in African people, 1602. And that Wall Street literally is built on the enslavement of Africans and the genocide of the indigenous people. In fact, under Wall Street today are buried, are the bodies of 15,000 Africans. Literally, it is built on the backs of African people. And I think that is so telling that it is such a, a graphic understanding of, of what the system is really about. Here is New York slave market on Wall Street. Right here, this is Wall Street. That's where it was built. That is the formation, the stock, the first stock were African people. African enslavement is the foundation of U.S. wealth. And we don't have time to show all the details of that, but study it yourself. Go into history. Find another way that white people made money that wasn't tied to the trade in African people or some extension of that or offshoot of that or the genocide against the indigenous people or the colonialism around the world. And this is what made Europe and the US, US wealthy and powerful. This is what created the, the, the castles and the great buildings of Europe. And that it also transformed the peasants, the serfs of feudalism into white workers, as the chairman tells us. So the whole, all of the peasants in Europe were set free, supposedly, from the land and taken to Liverpool and to Manchester, England, and to other places where they were needed now to build the ships for the enslavement of Africans and to process the coffee and the indigo and the sugar and all of the products that were coming from the Americas for, uh, based on the, the enslavement, the slave labor of African people. The resources needed for the factories in Europe and the U.S. are based on the enslavement colonialism and occupation. And, and it means that their true price is not factored in to the salaries and the cost of commodities that we enjoy, the, the standard of living that we have had. If, if, for example, in Congo today, where Africans, seven million Africans have been slaughtered in the past seven or eight years based on the, the reality of the minerals there, including coltan, which is which Congo has 87% of the world's coltan um, that is necessary for computers, for cell phones, and we see, you know, this U.S.-backed and, and imperialist-backed armies that are slaughtering the people there to maintain control of the minerals of the Congo. What if and when, actually, this will happen in the process of liberation of Africa, if Congo is controlled by the people and they say, well, yeah, you can buy our coltan, but we pay our workers $25 an hour and benefits. You're not going to get a computer for the $1,200 or whatever you're paying for it. Now you're not going to get your cell phone for $100. We're going to have to pay the price that is real in the entire world, that this has been the hidden reality that the reality that we experience, all of us, all of us, regardless of our income or anything else, built on the pedestal of the oppression of everybody else on the planet. So millions of European immigrants came to the U.S. in the 19th century in particular based on opportunity on the backs of the enslavement of Africans and, and the, the slaughter of the indigenous people. So there were, you know, workers over in Europe in the 1840s who were struggling for revolution and, and higher wages and unions and this kind of thing. But when they came to the U.S., they didn't struggle for that anymore. They wanted to keep 
the enslavement of Africans so that they could have the jobs. They picked up the gun and became the pioneers, which is an armed civilian militia going out west to slaughter the indigenous people as settler colonialists and stealing their land. So this is why, this is why the theory of African internationalism and Chairman O'Malley Chitella tells us all of us sit on the pedestal of slavery and genocide. And that's, you know, we want to say, well, I didn't do that. You know, I'm not part of that. But we are part of it. We inherited it. As Chairman said, we are the children of the slave masters facing the children of the enslaved. They didn't do it. We didn't do it. We live off the loot that was stolen. This is the social wealth that, that we experience. All of us sit on this pedestal. And this is key for us to understand because we cannot equate a poor white person with a colonized person around the world. We still have the ability to get a mortgage, get a student loan, get out of this. We still have a cousin who's got money. We still have, what is it, 60% of white families are able to give their children uh, a down payment for a mortgage versus almost none in the African community. This is the social wealth that we understand. And as the chairman says, this is scientific. This is scientific, and I, I challenge you. Can you say another way that this country was built? The chairman answers that question. He says, no, 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 a thousand times no. What would, there, could there be an America without the enslavement? Could there be an America without the genocide of the indigenous people? I mean, they say that the Vikings came here prior to Columbus and all of that. Well, nothing happened because they didn't have their army, they didn't have their, you know, enslaved Africans, they didn't start killing the, the indigenous people. So ultimately they just went back to Iceland or whatever. And you know, this is this is how it was built. There is no other way. We have to look at this truth. And as the chairman says, this is the birth of the white nation. This is the birth of the white nation. There wasn't a a concept, as the chairman says, of Europe prior to the enslavement of African people. There were warring tribes and different groupings. There wasn't a concept of Europe that were fighting each other and that Europe got its consciousness as a white nation based on the enslavement of African people and the, basically the colonization of the majority of the people the, we say, the founding fathers were supposed to say, oh, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the great thinkers, but they were, they owned Africans, 300, 400 Africans they owned. They carried out the policy of genocide against the indigenous people. This is the basis of this country. This is the basis of America. And that white people have participated in, in it since day one, armed in the people's state of the white nation. And that we have voluntarily carried out the terror against Africans. We have participated. I mean, it really wasn't like, you know, the US government was sending out memos, you must terrorize Africans. We did it, our ancestors did it. It was part of, it was essential to the fabric of white society, it still is. It's more hidden in some kind of ways, and in some kind of ways it's more blatant today. But it, it is there, we have always participated in it, we have never struggled against it, and that we have been volunteers. We weren't, we weren't lynching our bosses who were ripping us off. We were attacking Africans, and we were saying to our bosses, do whatever you want with us because we're white. You know, we, we, deserve, we deserve to be on the pedestal of the oppression of African people. We voluntarily have carried out the colonial policies. We sided with our own ruling class against waging terror against African people. This was, you know, read the history. There were 10,000 recorded what's called a lynching, terrorist attacks against African people. And there are many, many more that weren't, weren't recorded. And there were, there were ones that tens of thousands of white people came to. There were, you know, you can see there, there's other pictures of, of white people with their children, all dressed up with a bow in their hair and a little pinafore on, all starched in, in front of the bodies of African people. It, it, it's white people saying, 
you know, we want up there on that pedestal. We want more of the stolen loot. We, you know, we participate in, in this terror and this, this colonialism of African people. And that white people in Europe and in the United States participated in the colonial terror in, in, in the Congo 150 years ago that carried out the genocide of 10 million Africans, the mutilation by cutting off the hands of African people so that we could get the Michelin tires and that comes from the uh, plantations of King Leopold. We participated in the colonization of Africa and the ability to get oil and diamonds and gold and everything else, ivory, that came out of Africa that slaughtered for sport by the British. And where was the outcry? Where was the outcry from the regular white population or people that considered themselves leftists and communists up at that time? None. In Germany, the Germans slaughtered four-fifths of the Herero people of Namibia. That is genocide. But it wasn't, there wasn't even a word genocide then. It didn't come into the English language until white people killed other white people in Europe in the 1940s, when all white people in Europe were participating in slaughtering Africans and indigenous people, it, there was no word for that. There was no treaty. There was, you know, there was nothing. It, it was considered, it was accepted. And in 1884 and 1885, Europe got together in Berlin and carved up Africa, created the borders that exist in Africa today that had one purpose, which was to facilitate the extraction of resources into Europe. They always say in Africa that the railroad lines run one way to the coast, to the coast, to just keep taking out, taking out the resources of Africa, and that's going on today. And inside the U.S., Africans live under colonialism. This is, this is so important for us to understand because if we are just thinking about the question of racism, it's so silly. How can the ideas in our heads change the conditions that people live in. The, the question of racism is ridiculous because that keeps us in the center. It says all we have to do is take a $600 weekend course on unlearning racism and everything's going to be fine. But then at the end of that, we go back to our communities and the African communities are still catching hell where they live because the reality is it is a struggle for political power on the part of African people. It is a national liberation struggle, no different than the people of Iraq, the people of Vietnam, the, people, the Palestinian people. It is a struggle, an anti-colonial political power inside the borders of the United States. So we have about at least six million African people in the U.S. prison system every year, arrested for things that we don't even get arrested for, that our kids don't go to jail for, they go to you know, they, they call daddy and he brings a lawyer. I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't happen in that way. And that this is a colonial prison system. It is, it is not anything to do with crime or rehabilitation. It is about amassing Africans in concentration camps that are called prisons. And, you know, we can look at the past and we can look at what Europe and U.S. And, and white people have done to African and oppressed peoples historically. But I feel that, you know, when, when history tells the story, they're going to say about what happened today, what the U.S. is doing now, what white people are doing and participating in now uh, with this railroading of, of Africans into these concentration camps right here inside the U.S. that also makes billions of dollars for us, and one in eight of all prisoners in the entire world, as Glenn Ford from Black Agenda Report states, is an African in the U.S., that the U.S. has the highest prison population in the world. It is 25% of the world's prison population, and half of that, at least, is African. So this is the reality that we're facing, and that prisons are a way of economic development. They're the original stimulus. They created billions of dollars worth of jobs and still do. It is the only growth industry in this period of crisis that's still out there. The prisons are growing because 
they are still creating jobs for the white population. In fact, if we look at where are the prisons, the majority of them are in white areas of, of states. You know, um, the upstate New York and, and the Central Valley of California, etc. This is where the prisons are. They're jobs for white people. It's a trillion dollar prison industry, economic stimulus for the white population. This is the war going on against the African population. Everything that they're doing in Afghanistan, they do here. The, what is the difference in the uniforms that you know the troops wear going into Afghanistan and other places? They do it here. The, the, the way they go house to house and break down the doors of people and seize them and, and criminalize the people and, and, and have helicopters flying all over. This is the war right here. We don't, we don't even have to talk about Afghanistan. If we stop this war, if we stop what the U.S. is doing to Africans right here, it would have to stop its international policy to you know, what's happening to people around the world. And this is the colonial state. It has been generally reserved for colonial subjects around the world. We have accepted that. We have united with that. And today, the indigenous people live on reservations with a life expectancy of 47 years on their own land. Where is the outcry? Where is the outcry about that? So clearly, as we're seeing, that this is not racism. This is colonialism inside the U.S. We sit on the pedestal of the oppression of African people. That is a colonial structured relationship. And that the political and economic domination of a people by a foreign power for economic gain. That's the definition of colonialism. Well, that's what the relationship of the white population to Africans inside the U.S., as well as around the world. Again, we talk about the social wealth of the oppressor nation, that we can get the scholarships, we can get the student loans. This is there. This is the ability for white people, however poor, to climb up this ladder of success, to sit on the pedestal of the oppression of African people. And that we have to understand that white people are 5% of the world's population, white people in the U.S., but 50% of the entire world's resources are in our hands. So this is what people are struggling around all around the world. They want their resources back. They want their land back. And they want the U.S. military and every form of a political and economic control by the U.S. and Europe out. They want the ability to feed their children and to live in, in peace and, and in their own interest. And as the chairman says, white people have always seen ourselves as the subjects of history. This is why we're in a crisis now, that Africans and oppressed people have been the objects of history. We have been the so-called subjects of history. So we have a book about the diary of Anne Frank, and we can see how Europeans have suffered in this situation and that situation. But where's the diary of an indigenous child, victim of the genocide? Where's the diary of an African child, victim of enslavement? It's, it's not a real person. It's, you know, we learn that we are the most intelligent. We are the most, we're also the most moral. Don't we learn that? Oh, we're the ones that really need to impose morality on the rest of the world. And that we are the ones that are the most rational and we understand this the best. This is seeing ourselves as the subjects of history. And colonized people, African people, are nameless, faceless statistics of objects of history. So what is happening right now is that those who have been the objects of history have found their voice, they are rising up, they are stating their demands, they are taking back their freedom and liberation in an incredible way, in outbursts all over the world, that they are becoming the subjects of history. And if white people don't join in solidarity with that, we are being part of the trash can of history. And this is, this is what we have to understand, because African people have always waged fierce resistance always, for the past 600 years, indigenous people as well. But now we're at the end game of imperialism. Now it's over. It can't rule in the same old way anymore. It can't, as the chairman says, pick up the phone and, and say, you know, we want more oil from the Middle East, send it. It can't do that anymore. It gets resistance everywhere. And we can see how imperialism was a conscious policy. Cecil Rhodes, who was 
the vicious imperialist magnet of, from Britain um, who wanted to, to bring British colonialism to the entire continent of Africa. He had a slogan called From Cape to Cairo that shows him standing across and straddling Africa. He said that if you want to avoid civil war because the white workers of Britain are rising up for bread, bread, and, and more money, we have to become imperialists. He was clear about that. He said we have to be able to take the resources of Africa and, and flood it into Britain and enable white workers to have a bigger share of that. So we say that African and colonized peoples have a right to resist. They're still resisting. And that the Uhuru movement, which is led by the African People's Socialist Party, is about power in the hands of African people. The African Socialist International is the organization of African People's Socialist Party organizations all over the world, whether in Europe, whether in Africa, whether in the US. It is one huge organization of African People's Socialist Party working <coughs> to liberate Africa. It is very serious about carrying that out. African people will be free. We will see this in our lifetime. We will see the struggle because it is down to the wire. And, and imperialism in crisis is a vicious imperialism. And the people on the planet Earth are ready to fight. They have nothing to lose now. Will we be on that side? That is where the future is. Will we be part of bringing down this imperialist system? Africans as one people all around the world fighting for their resources, ivory, gold, even musicians owned by white power. Lions and animals and coffee and, and coltan and, and, and the arts, all of it taken out of Africa. Africa wants it back. That's what reparations is about. And so the white life on the pedestal has been the material basis of opportunism. And basically what we have done is stand on the top of the pedestal and fight for our rights at the expense of everybody else. We said, well, we're white women. So we don't care. I mean, read, read these women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and all this stuff that were incredibly uh, hostile to the African community and to the liberation of African people. They're saying, we want our rights. We want to share. We want a greater percentage of everything you guys steal. We want more of it. You've got to share it with us. We carry out your work. We are lynching Africans. We're killing indigenous people. We want our share of it. That's what the struggle's been about, if you really look at it. How can we say, you know, we can look at um, the white gay movement. It was called the gay liberation movement, based on the black liberation movement of the 1960s. Well, what is the highest paid sector of the entire U.S. population today? It's the gay and lesbian sector of the population. So it's been about, well, we want the right to fight in Afghanistan. We want the right to be a, a policeman shooting down Africans. In the, in the African community. Is that what we're struggling for? You know, is that what, if that's what it's been about, though. It's been about getting our rights at the expense of everybody else. And that's called opportunism. And that's why we had to have our comrade Dan here <laughs> at Occupy saying, we're not the 99%. We live at the expense of the 99%. And that's very courageous to put that out. It doesn't mean we're not screwed over by imperialism. Of course we can be. But we've always, because of this pedestal, been able to solve our problems. Well, we got ours. Too bad you didn't get yours. It's not going to be like that. We have to say, you know, we stand in solidarity with the 99% of the world. In fact, did you know that the lowest salary in the white population is in the top 13% of salaries in the entire world? We're not the 99%, we're the top 20% of the world. How can we honestly say and know that the rest of the world, half the world lives on $2.50 a day and it is not cheaper to live there in Africa and other places, and that we're the 99%? Give me a break. We know that's not true. We know that it's not true. To say that, that we are the 99% is about us struggling on the pedestal with the bankers and the ruling class to say, come on, you've got to give us more, deliver. We want more of what you're ripping off from 
Congo and from the Middle East and every place else. While the whole rest of the world is trying to tear down the pedestal, we're on the top of it. That was, that's going to give you a lot of anxiety. That's going to give you a lot of anxiety. We have to say that, you know, when we join the people on the planet Earth, our back is covered because we're standing inside the belly of the beast doing what we have to do to help bring down this system that's a blood-sucking parasitic system that's given us something to turn us, you know, to us against our own humanity for ourselves, for our stomachs and our pocketbooks, as the chairman says, um, at the expense of everybody else. That's going to make you anxious. That's going to make you have to live with security bars all over your house and your windows and everything else. The way that we get security is to join the people on the planet Earth, to understand that this system has to go. Imperialism has to go. White working people, we unite with our own ruling class. Last week when we were in Paris, we were also in London um, for the weekend, and this was the, this queen person's jubilee of 60 years. The whole of London was shut down. Now, we have to realize this woman is one of the wealthiest people, parasites in the world, based on British colonialism that was so, expanded the globe so enormously that they said the sun never set on the British Empire. It went all around the world. This is where she got her money from, her diamonds, her gold, and everything else stolen from Africa. How many Africans killed? How many Indians killed? So that this character could be sitting there. They closed down all of London, and the people came out in the freezing cold weather to watch this queen on a boat in the Thames. But, you know, the ruling class wasn't there. And uh, probably a lot of the middle class wasn't there. It was the white workers who were getting screwed over by the British government that was out there. Wow, our queen. We were so excited about our queen because, you know, we identify with this. So, you know, we understand that white terror against African and colonized peoples has been carried out. It still is. It still is carried out in our name by the white population, sanctioned, whether it's by the police, by the army, or anything else that, you know, we have been and still are complicit with this and here and all around the world so that we could experience the highest standard of living in the entire world at the expense of everybody else. This isn't going to work anymore. And this has robbed us of our humanity. This has robbed us of our connection with everybody else. And that, frankly, life on this pedestal of everybody else's oppression isn't sustainable because they're trying to tear it down. They want it off. They want it out. So as the crisis of imperialism deepens and the resources become scarcer and scarcer, not only because they've been so depleted by a system that would just use everything up as it slaughters, slaughters human beings, but also because the people around the world are saying, we're going to control our oil. We're going to control our diamonds. You, you don't have, you go to Venezuela. You know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to tell us how to deal with this. You're not going to set the prices for this. And that, you know, we can see that the full force of the imperialist state can be turned on white people. It, you know, here we have the Occupy movement in a place like Oakland, California, where how many tens of thousands, I bet, Africans have been killed by the police. I lived there for 20 years. I live there. know that Africans catch hell, and you have the Occupy movement talking about the police brutality as if it were in, not in a context of a brutal war against the African community there. You know, this is, this is self-interest. This is opportunism, and this has to go. So what we have to do is join the world. We have to say we're going to be part of humanity. We have the same goals, that we are under the, the leadership of the African revolution that the enslavement and commodification of African people on the stolen land of the indigenous people and colonialism, we understand that as the basis for all the wealth in the white world. There really isn't anything that's ours. There's nothing that's ours. And this is why the African People's Socialist Party formed the African People's Solidarity Committee, also our mass organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, under its leadership. Because we can't be, you know, if we're struggling we always like veer back to our own interests. But this way we're tied to the strategy of African liberation. We're tied to the rest of the world. It is an incredible experience to, to realize that any place on the planet 
that somebody is struggling against imperialism, I'm part of that struggle now. You know, I'm part of that. I'm part of that. And my job is to take it on right here. Right at the churches, the Girl Scouts, our families. We have to go in there. We have to win. You know, we don't want our families to go down with the sinking ship, the Titanic of imperialism. Come on over. Come on over. Join the world. Imperialism has to go, and we have a job to do. So African People's Solidarity Committee works under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. But going into the white communities and struggling for the question of reparations. And that is one of our main campaigns. And that is a scientific thing. Yes, there is revolutionary morality. I believe that. Because there's a wrong that must be righted. Look what we have done to Africans. Look what imperialism has done to African people, oppressed people. You know, it must, that debt must be paid. The, the, we have to understand that our forebears and our, ourselves today, we have to, we, we make conscious decisions and in our actions. And that has, there is accounting for that. You know, we have to take responsibility for that. But there's also a scientific reason why, why, the reparations have to be paid to African people because everything that this country has is on the foundation of the theft of African resources and African labor and African arts and, and every kind of thing like that. And that, in, that capitalism is born on stealing the resources, the labor, from others for our benefit. So if we want capitalism to go, imperialism to go, the resources hoarded here have to go back to the African Revolution. That's just science. That's, that's like, you know, sometimes they call it the redistribution of the wealth of the world. The people are taking back what's theirs. If we want to see the system go, we have to say, we're not hoarding 50% of the world's resources anymore. It's got to go back to Africa. It's got to go back to the peoples on the planet Earth to whom it, from whom it was stolen. This is just simply a revolutionary strategy. There's enough for the entire world to, to live in prosperity. It can't all be in our hands. And so this is the anti-imperialist stand that we have to take. This is what determines if we're revolutionary or not, is our stand on the question of reparations. And so we understand that under the leadership of the African Socialist Party, we're revolutionaries. We want revolution. All kinds of people, Wendy said, can join this movement, and that's true. But those of us in the African People's Solidarity Committee are down for the struggle. We're down for the struggle. And again, we have a role to play inside the borders of the U.S., inside the belly of imperialism. We have to, we have to take that on. And one of our campaigns has been the March Against Genocide a march against colonialism inside the borders of the U.S. This was in Berkeley, California. We did this all through the 80s and the 90s out there. And we organized for white people's reparations to African people since early on in the African People's Solidarity Committee. One of the things that we helped build was a group foods. Uh, we used to sell chocolate chip cookies all over the place at Grateful Dead shows, at anti-war marches, all this kind of thing to raise money. And sometimes, these serious leftists would say, well, I wanted to be a revolutionary. I didn't want to bake chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and, you know, this is a revolutionary act because we're out there talking to white people and, and raising resources for the African Revolution in the stance of reparations. And so, you know, we call for genuine solidarity, not charity, not charity. This is our responsibility as human beings, as revolutionaries, active reparations to the African community. We have Uhuru pies every holiday season. And I think Wendy talked about that a little bit. You've got to go. It's going to be a powerful, powerful project that's going to involve putting a kitchen, a, a commercial kitchen into the Uhuru house and, and building a, a garden, a community garden, all kinds of, of projects that are going on there in the process of building economic development for the African community. We have a day in solidarity with African people that is going to be in the Bay Area of California here in Philly. And this is also a fundraiser for the work of the African People's Socialist Party. And this year, 
We will be building a day in solidarity in London and I think in Frankfurt or another city in Germany. So, you know, we say that we call for support for Africa's resources in African hands. This is reparation to African people. That we have to join the world. We have to change the world. We have to be organized. We have to be part of organization. We can't do it ourselves. Sitting in a cafe thinking about these ideas doesn't work. We have to be part of an organization and the strategy of the African revolution itself. Building AKSC in Europe, as I said. So we're calling on everybody today to become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Help join the world. Bring down imperialism. Take it on. Win others like us. If we understand that we are part of the world, we have nothing to fear about this, this future. It is only to the extent that we identify with imperialism, want to preserve it, we can join the rest of the planet in transforming the earth and making it a place without war, without hunger, in which all human beings can live in justice and in peace. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru.